I'm Dr. John Cruz, and today I'm going to be talking about testosterone and ADHD. It's the connection. Testosterone in humans and in other species has different effects at different times of development, has different effects in the different genders, and certainly dosage and other factors have different effects. But there's some mild consensus that in utero, so while the fetus is developing, exposure to higher levels of testosterone does seem to increase the risk of developing ADHD. That's not complete consensus on that. And the effect may be more significant in baby boys than in embryos that are going to be women. I am aware that everyone does not fit into two simple and simplistic genders or binaries or a binary. So I will try to keep things simple, though, by usually keeping it as such. Research in lab animals, rodents suggested Ritalin may commonly decrease testosterone levels in people. It does not, particularly men, does not seem to commonly do that, although it can occasionally, may also occasionally boost testosterone levels. Maybe most interesting and least study part is there are at least some individual adults who, when administered testosterone, may have very thorough and satisfactory resolution of ADHD symptoms. So I'll be talking about that. Those are mostly case examples. So testosterone is a steroid hormone. It's built out of the cholesterol molecule. We need cholesterol. It's absolutely essential for life. And one of the reasons it's essential, it's a building block for many hormones, steroidal hormones, including testosterone and estrogen. So testosterone in the body is converted to estrogen. So all of your estrogen was originally at least testosterone. It's converted by an enzyme called aromatase. Testosterone is also changed by other enzymes called reductase to dihydrotestosterone, which is even more potent as an androgen or male-like hormone. There is a small family of male androgen sex hormones in the body, just like estrogen, estradiol. There are multiple female sex hormones in the body as well, not to even bring in the confusion with progesterone, which is another set of steroid sex hormones. This is oversimplifying, but we have to do that sometimes. The default brain organization is a female brain organization. So if you don't do anything to disrupt it or alter its path of development, the female is the default mode. Starting at about eight weeks of gestation, fetuses that have testes start producing, winds up being substantial amounts of testosterone. That testosterone goes to the brain, and within the brain, as far as we can tell, that aromatase molecule is present, and most of the testosterone is converted over to estrogen, and it's actually the effects of estrogen that masculinize our default female brain. So that already is a twist. When we're talking about hormone levels of, of these sex hormones, we often just simply refer to testosterone, but there's also what's called sex hormone binding molecule. And the testosterone has to be free from this binding hormone to be active in cells. If you have huge amounts of that binding hormone, you might have normal amounts of testosterone, but it may be bound so closely that it's not free or available to act. And conversely, you may have what look like low normal levels of testosterone, but if your binding hormone is low, it may physiologically be okay and the more is available. Testosterone, estrogen, most of how they're thought to have actions on the brain and other parts of the body is they bind the receptors on the surface of these brain cells and then they enter the cell body. And they interact with the genome to either activate or inactivate specific genes. So much of what these sex hormones are doing, particularly during development, isn't a direct action or release of neurotransmitters. It's a epigenetic. It's modifying the genes, so affecting what gets expressed in that cell. There are some direct effects of testosterone also binds to the 
GABA A receptor. It doesn't bind where GABA does, but we have several molecules, several families of molecules, including alcohol, including benzodiazepines, that bind to the GABA A molecule and change its shape so it is more or less receptive to GABA. And testosterone appears to do that. That may be primarily how it's helpful for depression and anxiety. ADHD is much more prevalent in males and in females. Although some part of this is females more likely having inattentive forms and or females more likely being faced by stronger societal rules to behave, be quiet, don't cause a trouble when a boy is. There's probably at least some issues with ADHD being detected at lower rates in females. We're trying to change that, and I think some of it is changing. But certainly in kids, we still, almost every study I'm aware of still finds a sex skewing. So the question that arose from this is that testosterone itself is something present during early developmental life, contributing to brains that are different and that wind up being more susceptible to developing into an ADHD pattern brain. There's also theories consistent with much of the data suggesting that that masculinized brain, the effects of testosterone prenatally do reduce the risk for depression and anxiety later in life. So one of the interesting things is how do we measure what your fetal exposure to testosterone is like? And the answer is right in your hand. So we have what's called the 2D, 4D ratio test. So 2D refers to second. I'm going to show you this in 3D. So 2D, your index finger, 4D, your ring finger. Found many years ago that men tend to have a longer ring finger than index finger. Women, they tend to be close to the same size. And the way it's measured is that for most people, the index finger of 2D has a single crease. So if you measure from the midline center of the crease up the tip of the finger, and then you measure, and for most people, as I do, the ring finger has a couple creases. If you measure from the crease closest to the palm, to the tip there. So it's often hard to judge just looking particularly lined up, but if you line them up so that the creases are sort of on the same level, which is kind of like that. It's easier to see that my ring finger is longer than my index finger, which goes along with being most in most males. But again, the extent of that suggests higher testosterone exposure. And again, there are several studies and a few meta-analyses finding, and most often we're measuring this in the right hand, which more consistently shows these differences that low 2D, 4D ratio, high testosterone seems to result in greater likelihood of developing ADHD, but particularly in males, although there are certainly some studies indicating lower 2D to 4D ratio. Again, the ratio is higher to begin with in females as a group, but if you compare them to their group averages, there's some indication that that's also more likely those women with higher prenatal exposure to testosterone may be more likely to have ADHD. Some of these studies have been done in different cultures and communities, but there are at least more than a handful of conflicting studies not finding this ratio. So one way of exploring some of this question in a different way, we have conditions that may either increase fetal testosterone exposure or decrease it, seeing whether those are linked with ADHD. So one of the conditions linked with higher exposure to testosterone is polycystic ovary disease. A mother with polycystic ovary disease more likely than match controls to have kids who develop ADHD in childhood. On the other hand, one study that looked specifically at testosterone levels in polycystic ovary mothers during the pregnancies didn't find a direct correlation of their testosterone levels on whether the kid had ADHD, but overall compared to non-polycystic ovaries, an increase in ADHD. Another condition that increases testosterone exposure to a developing fetus is 
twins. So if you have a dizygotic, so two separate eggs giving rise to two different kids developing at the same time in the same uterus, if one's a boy and one's a girl, that girl twin is exposed to substantially more testosterone circulating in the amniotic fluid getting into her body and into her brain than most girls would be subject to. So you think, aha, this is a high testosterone condition. If high testosterone really is an important player, and at least one study done has found lower rates of ADHD in twins, girl twins who had a boy cohabitating with them in utero. So that actually works against the hypothesis. And there's at least two conditions that have been moderately studied, which lower testosterone. One is Kleinfelter syndrome. So that's where instead of an X chromosome and a Y chromosome, someone has usually two X's and a Y. There's some slight other variants. You can have multiple X's. So lower testosterone, you think, ah, that should be lower rates of ADHD, but that's associated with higher rates of ADHD. There's correlation between phthalates one of the chemical constituents of plastic that are ubiquitous in our environment. But mothers who have higher circulating levels of phthalates, evidence from 2D40 and other studies suggest babies exposed to less testosterone, lower testosterone levels early in their development. I would think that that might be protective, but phthalate is also associated with higher rates of ADHD. Now, part of it could be as simple as, and this is overly simplistic, messing with other parts of the brain or other parts of development, contributing to the higher rates of ADHD by mechanisms completely separate from anything testosterone does. So maybe their impact on testosterone is just irrelevant. One interesting study published fairly in the last few years, rather than relying on 2D, 4D ratio, they looked at kids who had had amniotic sampling. Now, we usually don't like sticking big needles in pregnant women and extracting amniotic fluid, the fluid that's around the developing fetus, because there are risks in the pregnancy. So usually it's done in high-risk pregnancies to begin with. But one clinic in Scandinavia, a group of more than 100 babies, where they measured directly, they knew what testosterone level in the amniotic fluid was. And they measured the kids at 40 months of age for follow-up. And on at least three measures, at least we're not looking at diagnoses per se of full-blown ADHD. It's a little young, worse performance on delayed gratification tests. Greater proportion of problems with attention as reported by their parents and greater measures of hyperactivity. So the main domains of ADHD did seem represented, overrepresented in this group of kids or the, in the subgroup of kids who had elevated exposure to testosterone in the utero. So again, that would seem to support or encourage the higher testosterone can contribute to ADHD. Testosterone has different effects during development of the fetus than it does later on in life. And one of the concerns from rodent studies and a few case examples is kids who have been for years on Ritalin, and this is mostly young males in their late teens, early 20s, there have been handfuls of case reports of much lower testosterone than normal and either sexual performance difficulties, low sperm count, and at least in some of those individuals, stopping the Ritalin restored normal testosterone and functioning in the rodent models. Ritalin exposure, again, it's sometimes hard to know what where whether we're gaining an equivalent dose, but Ritalin exposure to rodents can more consistently lead to gonadal atrophy, low testosterone rates. In humans, prospective studies actually looking in a testosterone you can measure pretty accurately in the saliva. So it's not as intrusive as measuring some other hormones, but a few studies now have looked much more broadly to see if Ritalin in general is causing changes in testosterone and looking over at least a year in time, that does not seem to be the case. And there's at least one clinic in Turkey that's reported, again, not that Ritalin is having a negative effect on suppressing testosterone, but the opposite, that Ritalin actually resulted in at least six or seven kids who had premature puberty and development. Behavioral effects have looked at a narrow range of 
a thing. So they looked at depression, and again, testosterone does seem protective for depression, early years of development, but also later in life. So there are studies looking at men with low testosterone, where supplementing testosterone can alleviate depression, lower rates of anxiety, less deterioration of memory if your testosterone levels are within a normal range, very little attention to attention executive function other than sort of the higher cognitive function has been spatial abilities. Very early development exposure to testosterone seems to enhance male spatial abilities compared to female. In adults, the circulating letters of testosterone in males are about averaging 15 times higher. That's a huge range in magnitude, but there's a, a range within normal and there is some change in aging. Most women are in the 15 to 70, and that's nanograms per deciliter blood level, whereas men's are in the 260 to 900 plus range. So big variation in both. There are also circadian rhythms. There's ultrading rhythms popping around. So a single reading is a single reading. One group, and it's a clinic in Oslo, Norway, of a, a, a case series of just three individuals where all men, one in 20s, 130s, 140s, all robustly diagnosed with ADHD. All of them had trials of apovenidate or amphetamine or both, and for different health reasons, opted not to use much more traditional and were treated with steroids or with testosterone, specifically testosterone gels. They started either at 50 to 60 milligrams. One guy reduced down to 10 milligrams. The other two stayed at their dose. And in all three of these individuals, there were robust, fairly quick. So one of the three reported changes in a day or two in their ability to focus, concentrate, be less impulsive, whole range of ADHD symptoms good enough that they were able to stop their stimulants. So all three had been continued on just testosterone for their ADHD for at least four to five years. All three of them, if they took breaks from their testosterone treatment, had a relapse in their ADHD symptoms, although there were improvements in confidence and anxiety. Seems clear from the reports that these were not just simply mood effects. I have one person I'm working with, clear history of ADHD, some response to amphetamine products, but multitude of side effects and problems with those. She tried estrogen for perimenopausal issues. That exacerbated mood problems, which occasionally happens, and she was tried on five milligrams testosterone gel instead. And like these case reports in men reported a very substantial and positive improvement in ADHD symptoms within a day or two. And that's been sustained over the course of a few months so far. And again, it does not seem attributable just to mood changes. So again, these are anecdotal studies. I have a fair number of men who've been on testosterone for different reasons. And when I've been retrospect, and most of these did not have ADHD, but most of them did not notice any changes in attention, focus, impulsivity, hyperactivity. In general, testosterone, when it improves mood, does make people more active, but it's goal-directed, motivated action, exercise, competitions, rather than restlessness or fidgeting. So thanks. Stay healthy. Stay happy. Have a good week. 